All right. It's Jack Kellison here with the Chasing Dirt podcast with co-host Connor Clifford. How are you, Connor? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. We've got a special guest today. I've I've known this guy for a number of years indirectly, and I think I've shaken your hand a few times, but we've got Daryl Hicks here, a guru regarding everything sanitizing, disinfected. And how are you, Daryl? I'm doing great, Jack, and glad to be with you and Connor here today. And I think what we have to talk about today is essential to to life, and I think we don't give enough credit to to the role that cleaning disinfection plays in saving lives, but we need to do a much better job, and we'll get into that, but I just believe that with antibiotics being what they are right now, and these super bugs that are coming out and proliferating at the proper cleaning and disinfection of surfaces may be the ones the one of the things that saves mankind. I think you're I think you're on it and I think you, the skill set you have is something that I would say is a will a kind of a weak spot for most people in the cleaning business. And this whole podcast, the Chasing Dirt podcast is really talking about the industry in general and again, I cannot thank you enough Daryl for taking the time to do this, but let's I kind of start all these podcasts off the same direction, but How the hell did you get into the business of cleaning? Well, I was, my early adult life, I was working outdoors doing construction related stuff. I wasn't in the construction business. I was surveying and then doing construction inspection. The the economy back in the early 1980s was pretty bad. And so I had a guy from church that worked for service master at the time. And he recruited me to go to work in hospitals as a manager in hospitals. So I did that for service master was eventually bought out by Aramark. And so back in the service master days, I worked in hospitals in, in up in Des Moines, Iowa and Kansas City and St. Louis. And so this is where I'm at right now is in St. Louis. Anyway, I learned the right way to do things and it was a systematic way of cleaning. But anyway, being recruited into the cleaning business, I knew nothing about it and learned everything I did. The service master way of training ma- new managers is you have to do the job of every person that you are going to be supervising. And, um, you know, so that uh, a couple things is you know how hard it is to do the jobs. And uh, second of all, that, uh, you know, when they say it can't be done, you you say, let me show you. And uh, so it gives you some credibility, but also uh, the, the employees know that you're willing to roll up your sleeves and take off the tie and pitch in when necessary. You know what you're doing. So you really, you essentially started from the ground level and worked your way in. And I guess, unfortunately, you fell into a a little type setting, acute healthcare type setting, because you definitely learned trial by fire right off the bat from day one, I would imagine, right? Yeah, the first week I was cleaning patient rooms. So I come dressed, I did take my suit jacket off, but I had my necktie on and she was showing me how to clean the bathrooms and what have you. So she had me clean the toilet. I bent over with the toilet brush and started to clean the toilet and dip my tie in the toilet water. <laughs> and she laughed. She said, I get you guys every time on the head. Because she said, you got to get down there closer to it. And she just get a kick out of us dunking our neckties in the water. The best people in the world are on the front lines of cleaning and salt of the earth people who are honest and hardworking. And it just endeared me to them and to be able to be that advocate for them and be the person that goes to bat for them to administration or to a head nurse that's giving them trouble or whatever. But anyway, giving them a voice, they feel like they don't have a voice. Well said. Let me ask you that. When you stepped into there, again, I think depending on how you enter into the business of cleaning, there's certain priorities. If you're stepping in as, I wouldn't say, a normal contract cleaner, not really in a healthcare setting, disinfecting is probably the least thing on your mind. It's more about perception and approaching it from the healthcare side. You approached it more from a scientific. You had joint commissions coming in. You had people doing whatever they, you were dealing with lives, lives and safety of people in that facility. But if you were getting to the businesses, Connor and I had a podcast about this, about the youth getting into the business and trying to attract good talent that not only appreciate the business, but really want to understand various aspects of the business. But if you were stepping into the cleaning of the business, knowing what you know now, how, regardless if you're in a healthcare setting or if you're just a contract cleaner or you're even your exterior cleaning, 
What takeaways would you say to those getting into the business regarding disinfecting and sanitizing? Just again, tying into your kind of the way you entered the building. What would you like to know today that you didn't know when you started day one? Well, I had a pretty good foundation. I had a company service master had their own chemist and so their cleaning and disinfecting products were all private labeled. But so it was learning and chemistry and the pH of things. And really cleaning boils down to soil removal and pH and knowing how those two work together. And soil removal is key in my book, Infection Prevention for Dummies, that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, I say that we have depended on disinfectants for too long to kill the little boogers when we ought to be removing them. And we can do a better job if you can do a 95 to 98% soil removal with the right products and right cleaning products and a micro, good microfiber cloth. And there's not a lot left there on the surface whenever you're done that even if you don't disinfect, it's all about removing the food source from the bacteria that grows on those surfaces. And so if we can remove their food and their moisture, which are two things that all living things need to exist, oxygen would be the other one, but if we can remove their food source um, by removing the soil, then they starve to death. So... I think that we have to understand soil removal and then pH is the other one. And I think that we too often go through four products with high alkalinity and damaging surfaces with the corrosivity of some of our cleaning products. I would say toxicity of those cleaning chemicals. We want to make sure that we're providing safe environment for our cleaning staff, but also for the inhabitants of the building. And sure. we saw back in COVID that we were disinfecting things way too, too, I guess, often. The frequency of using disinfectants, it destroyed a lot of finishes and furnishing, furnishings. I was at a Lowe's not too long ago and the screen where you do the credit card kiosk there and there's a big sign and you know like font letters saying do not use cleaners on this screen because they had destroyed these screens on these kiosks and what have you the corrosivity of these chemi chemicals that we use are damaging surfaces that then cannot be disinfected because they're, they're cracked and crazed and they're corroded with, with just the corrosivity. Even stainless steel gets pitted and what have you, and then gives these spores and bacteria, viruses, a place to hide that regular wiping won't remove or won't kill what's there because they have too much places to hide. The corrosivity and the toxicity of the chemistry that we use, we need to understand and, and protect the health of people and, uh, and the environment. No, I think that's an interesting point because I, the whole, the people think about it, let's just disinfect. If you, th you see most people who have never cleaned before, they disinfect, what do they do? They spray and they wipe within three, three <laughs> yeah, seconds. The, cor the corrosive nature of it all, I, you don't think about that too often as well, but I look at it like a shoreline. If you have a smooth beach shoreline, you've got less areas maybe to swim on, but if you go to, mm. I'll use in Maine as an example, it's a rocky coastline. You've got a lot of, like you said, nooks and crannies. So the physical cleaning aspect is as important as the disinfecting step, if not more so. Safety yes, safety. because people use disinfectants and every one of those labels, if they have an EPA registration on there, says in the presence of 5% soil. Explain well, that. Explain that. Because see. Explain that because I think most people. Five percent. Explain that, Daryl, because I don't think yeah. most people understand that 5% rule because I think they, they think it's just verbiage. But to, explain that. To get registered, EPA was requiring in the testing and it's. The AOAC testing, EPA doesn't test chemicals, but you have to go through a an approved lab, EPA approved lab, to get your AOAC registra registration for your disinfectant. So if I want to make Daryl's disinfectant in my bathtub at home, then I can do that. But then I need to get these kill claims for different bacteria and uh, viruses and what have you. And so... Whenever they do this testing, they test it without any physical removal of soil. So they'll just take a stainless steel titer, which is just a stainless steel dipstick, basically, and they'll seed it with 
Do you want an MRSA claim on it or whatever pathogens you want to, to put on your label? That's what they seed it with. And then they dip it in there. And if you want a five minute kill claim or a 10 minute, and they leave it for that time and they take it out and then they see what survived. And so part of that was with in the presence of 5% soil. And that 5% soil at one time was a uh, horse serum. And so they give it a blood or horse serum, uh, 5% load, and then that's supposed to replicate the soil that may be on that surface. So these one-step cleaners and disinfectants that are out there, I have the disinfectant that we were using at the hospital I was at the time. I was talking to the president of the hospital. I asked her about this 5% soil. She said, Daryl, I tried to get my 5% removed from the label and say that it's only to be applied to pre-cleaned surfaces. And the EPA would not allow her to remove the 5% soil because she said, if you take a white paper towel, wet it with water, and you wipe it across the surface and you see it any other color than white, got more than 5% soil. So that 5% soil really insulates the surface and the bacteria that is on the surface. It will insulate it from the active ingredients in the disinfectant if it's greater than 5%. Gotcha. No one is, people in the business don't know that about disinfectants. And they just see it as a one-step clear and disinfectant. Like you said, they'll spray and wipe. And what I call mm. spray and pray. Pray that you kill what you intended to, but there's no physical removal. And chances are they're not killing much of what they intended to. So understanding that label and that 5% in the presence of 5% soil. And what I say is that C. diff is one of those things is uh, is hard to kill. You have to have a an intermediate level disinfect, and then there's this whole hierarchy of disinfectants, all the way from a low level disinfectant, all the way up to an intermediate or a sporocidal. A sporocidal is top of the pyramid as far as, as surface disinfection goes. But uh, so if you kill something at that level of spores, then it kills. All those organisms that fall underneath there on this whole pyramid of, of bacteria and viruses. To me, that's the gold standard is to use a disinfectant that would meet either at a minimum of intermediate level disinfectant, which would be a tuberculocidal. And I'm throwing a lot of stuff out about this, but I think we don't read labels. We don't understand them. And we... We just, like I said, we buy based on price or other factors, but there's a lot that goes into the selection of disinfectants and doing it the right way. Yeah, selection based upon the type of facility. I, I, yeah. Schools are, schools are definitely moving more toward a hospital type environment, if you would, like and maybe not as, as tight, as rigid as a hospital, but they are moving in that direction. COVID's changed, as you will probably agree, is the, right. the whole landscape has changed as far as disinfecting. Mm -hmm. We use the term, we went from the boiler room to the boardroom overnight within this business. And we all became mad scientists. And I think you probably saw, as I saw and everyone else saw, is the amount of chemists that came out of the woodwork, especially yeah. spe especially these foggers, these atomizers, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them, these devices that came out of nowhere and they were selling for several thousand dollars. And I remember the one I saw them that, that just shocked me the most was this guy had a gym and the news was there. The news was reporting, but he came out and he had this fogger. It looked like a paint gun, a spray gun. And I, you couldn't even see him after you spraying the disinfectant out there. And I was just thinking, oh, what is this guy? He's probably killing a lot of self among himself as well as his, his, his customers at the gym. But what did you see out of COVID? Not to jump too much around, but what did you see come out of COVID that just made you aware that the industry is still very far behind with really understanding disinfecting? We weren't prepared. And now since COVID, one of the things that came out of that as a positive EPA has a new class of disinfectants and it's for new and emerging pathogens mm -hmm. because we got caught without these disinfectants. So even though it may have a, let's call it a rhinovirus claim on a rhinovirus is your common cold. And it may have a rhinovirus, which the COVID itself was a very, by it being an enveloped virus, 
you could use soap and water and kill it. Because soap on your hands would, would kill the virus on your hands. So it's got this envelope around it and it's susceptible to soap. The label didn't, the label on that disinfectant didn't call out COVID-19 or SARS COVID. And so they, they made these <laughs> disinfected manufacturers go back and get them registered to meet this new in list. And so I think we're up to over 600 now on that in list, but they've created this new classification, which is for new and emerging pathogens. So it has to meet a higher standard than the list in products did because that is a virus side because COVID is a virus, but like Ebola that you remember when that happened back in the early 90s and we were scared to death in this country because no disinfectants had Ebola on their list of pathogens that it would kill. And so we scrambled. And so what EP is doing is forward thinking and thinking of the scenarios of what may come at us next. And there will be another one in these pandemics come closer together as time goes on just by virtue of the way the travel is today and it can be in Africa today and in New York tomorrow. Yeah. Someone hop on a plane and infect a whole plane full of passengers. And those are the scary movies that just I can't watch because I just see how easily this stuff gets passed around and, and how how it's, it's a zombie virus that uh, could come. And so they're trying to be forward thinking and thinking about what qualities should these disinfectants have? And so there's a new list that EPA has for new and emerging pathogens that I think ought to be on all the manufacturers list of getting that, that registration on their disinfectants because we need to be prepared having the disinfectants. But larger than that, I think is we need to, I think that we need to certify the frontline workers to a yep. certain standard. And get that certification and it demonstrates that they have that depth of knowledge that they can, first of all, protect themselves from doing things the wrong way and not wearing the PE properly. And one of the biggest travesties of this COVID was not having the PE. And I had a friend that was working in a hospital not far from here. She called me one day just practically in tears and she said that uh, we don't have isolation gowns for my people going into the patient rooms to clean. And the chief of nursing told her to go to Walmart and buy raincoats for them. Wow. Uh -huh. And uh, she said something that you can wipe off with a disinfectant. And she, this friend asked me what I was, what I would say. I said, I would tell her when I see nurses wear them, then my housekeepers will wear them. But we shouldn't prioritize the the essential workers and the essential work that's getting done. And I know hospitals opted to not have the housekeepers go in and clean these rooms because there were, they didn't have the right mask. They didn't have the right protective gowns and what have you. And nurses aren't going to clean rooms like a housekeeper does. And yeah. I think a lot of the staff getting sick with, with the virus, we still haven't figured out how to put E appropriately how to take it off. So this is why certification of those frontline workers is essential because they need to be, first of all, need to be compensated like their work is important. And I saw an article this week, Jack, I don't know if you saw it, but the guy that wrote the article said that we should have $30 an hour for cleaning people. And they said that would solve the, the revolving door of people coming and going in cleaning business. And he had a business model for that and made a business case for it. Just the turnover and having competent people doing those jobs. We don't know how many lives could be saved by doing that. But anyway, to certify them, and I can't get anybody interested in a national certification program where we build a curriculum and we, I don't care what job role they're in, public health is, protecting public health is essential. And as we saw in this pandemic, a lot of people getting sick just out there in public spaces and 
even people quarantining at home didn't prevent it from, from spreading. We need to be prepared by certifying those people, but I saw a lot of things going on. It seemed like we were really interested in it at first, and wherever I go to the grocery store and here they've got these wipes at the front there to wipe off your cart handles. And I look at it and it says right on the container, it says hand sanitizing. Yeah. I said, this isn't a disinfectant. They said, the wipe, it sanitizes your hands. I said, it's not a hard surface disinfectant. And they said, that's what they gave us to, to clean with. And wherever I went to the self-checkout, I saw the lady would come over with a spray bottle and spray it and then wipe it with a paper towel, the conveyor belt and the you know, kiosk there. So I, after she set it down, I looked at it and I said, this says glass cleaner on it. <laughs> and she laughs. She says, yeah, the other one that we were using was tearing up the screen on everything. So here's the public thinking they've got my best interests at heart. And they were just, it was what I call hygiene theater. Yeah. And like Kabuki theater is, there was a lot of that going on. Target, I go there and there's 10 kiosks and there's this one 18 year old kid over there with a spray bottle. As soon as you walk away from the kiosk, he's over there wiping it off. He's using the same cloth for all the kiosks. He never yep. changed his cloth. Mm. I said, all you're doing is picking up from this one and taking and spreading it to the others. And so, so I'll ask you this. How do we help that? You brought up the youth a couple of times and that's a real passion of mine to get the youth educated and move that forward and move this industry forward. And Jack and I talked to my podcast a lot about that. Give me some ways we can use the youth. And obviously they're not reading labels. You talk about certifications. They're not really interested in that and right or wrong, but talk to that. How do you think we get to them with all the YouTubes, TikToks? What is your opinion on that kind of stuff? And how do we use that as our friend? I think that it has to be, I don't want to say entertaining, but it has to be, has to be tested, dumbed down a little bit, hence the dummies books is that taking complex things and making them simple for them that if they could see, I think that we need to make make things visual, make the unseen seen. Yep. So whether that's with ATP or with these fluorescent markers, I think that there's a new, fairly new, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's called back to scan. B-A-C-T-I-S-C-A-N, I think. I have not seen that. But it actually will show show biofilm on a surface, but it will show it will show the areas that you missed. So they use it in the food production, Connor, to your point is this is making the unseen seen. And so you clean a surface and in the food production, they have to know if there is anything left after the cleaning goes on. The FDA makes them re-clean it with these back-to-scans. It will show you where you need to use ATP because it will be visually, you will see what was missed. And that's where you want to do ATP and not just guessing. We got to do this handle. We got to do this plate. And you do the same things always. This visualizes it for you. So I think that they're visually stimulated. And if you could see the before and the after, I think that they would get interested because when you start talking beyond yourself to the public, the people that, you know, at the end of the day, you want to go home and make sure that if your grandmother was put into the patient room, that it was clean enough for your grandmother to go in there. I guess it's the, the ethereal stimulation, of a higher calling to, to, preserve life. And like I said earlier, I think that we're entering those days when some of these things can live on the surface for a year undisturbed. And back to your point earlier, Jack, about soil, fecal matter the size of a pinhead is enough infective material to infect the next person with C. diff. And who is looking for pinhead size specks of poop on a bed rail or something? So, I'm a, I'm an advocate. I know I'm jumping around here, but I'm an advocate for to pre-clean everything. And that's the only way you're going to be sure that you get that soil load down and that the uh, disinfectant you're going to use is effective. But 
to the young people. And I think we ought to be going to these career fairs at colleges and recruiting these 22 year olds into the business because they can be, they can own their own company essentially in time. And so they need a career ladder. And I know relatives that have graduated four year degree and they went to work at Verizon because they got a free phone or something. And so we need to tap into that talent and put that degree to work. And as long as it deals with either business or human resources, I think those are some of the key factors in this cleaning business is human resources and business have a business acumen, but also that you're interested in saving lives. No, absolutely. You triggered me with that. I did see a briefly that article in that $30 an hour, but during COVID, what I saw too was a, it was about health and safety. Everyone waved that flag, but the reality was there was a lot of contract cleaners and a lot of other individuals making a lot of money to your point, being the theater of disinfecting. But Maybe right. we start to turn, and this might be a, this might be a, an article for you at some point or someone out there, but maybe we turn around from ROI, return on investment to ROL, return on life. Yeah. Well, well said. I think to I your like point, it. you think about that little pin head, head of poop that's on a rail left alone. How many people downstream could that eventually kill? How many would it kill? And again, we never know that answer because we don't have that level of detail, but. The reality, people who are dying of diseases are not dying from large clumps of things falling on them. It's the no. small things, to your point, you cannot see. So I love that. I love what you just outlined there. Now, to dive in this a little bit. Now, so people know you're no longer in the hospital environment. You are a consultant that specializes in disinfecting. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And I work with all businesses, but getting them to understand and really being an advocate for educating frontline workers. And I hear people say, well, if I educate them and they leave, and I said, well, if you don't educate them and they stay. Absolutely. And education has got to be key, but I like the idea of that ROL or yeah, ROL. It's, it's really about life-saving. We're in the life-saving business care where you're cleaning. I've gone into public restrooms that I would give a thumbs up. They, and we go by visual, but I go as much by smell. <laughs> My wife and I walk into a restaurant and it, you can smell the dirt and the carpet or you go to the restroom and the air, the cherry bomb air deodorizer hits you 10 feet before you even get to the door to open it. And all they're doing is using fragrances to cover up filth. Perceptions. And yep. so if it, if it needs an air deodorizer, it probably needs to be cleaned. And so bacteria has got a lot of places to hide. And it's that decaying bacteria that winds up smelling so bad in restrooms. It's the uric acid that gets into the grout and the, the tiling and what have you. But it's about removing that stuff. And to me, the definition of clean is just basically just like carrying, taking out the trash. It's to remove the soil and take it out of the building in one way or the other, whether it's through a vacuum or an auto scrubber or a mop bucket it is, but our job is really to, to remove it from the building. Yeah. Let's, and let's make that note too, because I think that's, you said it earlier and I, we started first talking. I looked for 30 minutes last night for my dummies book, but Daryl's claim to fame and how I bumped into you. And I thought it was brilliant because I, to your point earlier about the youth getting into the business. And again, I was a younger man then, but when your disinfecting for dummies came out, I thought it was the coolest thing ever because it validated our industry and validated the port of disinfecting. But you still have that book out there and that's available. Amazon, probably any, any major. No, not through Amazon. It's through, I think I've got the last ones in existence. It was published back in. 2010, and that was the last edition. The first one was Infection Control for Dummies, and the Infection Preventionists didn't like that. So the next one came out was Infection Prevention for Dummies. But it's really about preventing. And you said earlier, we don't know how many lives we saved because it was the accident that didn't. Yeah. But, well, how many, uh, if, if someone wants to get your book, how would they go about it? Would you, would you go to a website? Where, where do you go? Just email me, DarylHicks.com. That's D-A-R-E-L at Daryl Hicks, H-I-C-K-S dot com. I'll put that in the show notes, but it's yeah, actually a good I'll, resource. Thank you. And I do get requests from people in all businesses and it's 
gone around the world, I, there's probably about 35,000 of them in circulation. And, oh. but anyway, it is, it's something that is a passion of mine because at the time, whenever I originally wrote the infection control for dummies in 2008, I was president of the International Executive Housekeepers Association, and they approached me about writing this clean for clean and disinfection. And uh, at the time, my, we had just found out my daughter-in-law, who was 37 at the time, my, the mother of three of my grandchildren, the youngest was 16 months at the time, but she was training for triathlons, whatever, spending a lot of time in the gym. And she got an infection between her thumb and her first finger. It just wouldn't go away. Eight weeks later, she was dead. Well, uh, and it was MRSA that she picked up at the gym. That because is bloodstream infection. Uh, that so happens. there's your gym story. And we don't know where it's at, but MRSA can be culture from practically everything society but that became a personal passion of mine sure. yeah because uh, it changed our family forever i can imagine i might our condolences to you the family that's crazy stuff yeah. talk talk about that a little bit though because i think we touched on a little bit but again this is my naivety i know some about it and you'll tell me where i'm wrong but there's a difference between cleaning sanitizing disinfecting and sterilization and i think everyone kind of lumps some of those into the same buckets but you mentioned cleaning we're basically removing soil load so the just is taking the food source away taking the whatever it is that we need to do but where i see the biggest thing and this is what amazes me is the difference between sanitizing and disinfecting you see this 99.9 percent .9 kill claims but there's two things it's not 100 percent, so that's not truly a disinfecting and the second thing is you really got it to your point earlier. You've got to look at the label to see what it actually even kills the time it takes to kill. But can you elaborate on cleaning versus sanitizing versus disinfecting versus sterilization? Can you get on that? Yeah. Cleaning is soil removal and doesn't disinfect. But as I said earlier, if we can remove 98% of the soil from a surface, and capture it in that microfiber cloth and hold it and not spread it around the room. I see this thing happening. You see it happen in restaurants all the time. They've got a bucket that they go around and clean the tables after people get up. And I just wish I could take, I would be, I wouldn't go back there to eat if I took an ATP in there and, and really looked at the soil load that is, is unaffected by these ineffective and the wrong way of doing things. But anyway, cleaning is soil removal and with the soil goes the bad guys. There's no disinfecting in cleaning other than removing the food source, as you said, the food and the moisture that it takes for them to survive. And disinfection, a disinfectant, to have a disinfectant claim, it has to reach a six log reduction. So whenever I described that to you, Connor, earlier about the steel titers and the disinfectant for the prescribed five minutes, wherever you want on your label, and then they take them out and they count how many survivors there are. And there, out of 60 of those titers, there has to be 59 with nothing on them. And that is a six log reduction. But as I said to you earlier, Jack, there is no physical removal with that process. That's where I think people lose sight of the fact that we dwell so much time on the dwell time of these disinfectants. They're applied to a pre-clean surface, whether you take three different classifications of disinfectants, phenolics, quaternary uh, ammoniums, or bleach-based products. They're applied to a pre-clean surface. They reach maximum kill at 30 seconds, all three of them. And this is in scientific studies. There's at least 14. This was back in 2008, whenever the CDC came out with their cleaning and disinfection guidelines. At that time, there were at least 14 scientific studies that say that it reaches maximum kill at 30 seconds. After that, it's just, it just plateaus. It doesn't continue to rise. Let me so, ask you this. Let me ask you this, Daryl, though, that I've heard this before. 
the time, the kill time, you hear, you know, what even now today, but more so 10 years ago, the kill time was, the kill claims were 10 minutes and everyone was okay with that. Now it's, it's a race to zero almost of who can kill the quickest, but is that more marketing, the kill claim, like you said? No, because the reality is, so when does that 10 minute start? When you apply it to the surface, because it's going to air dry if you don't leave it soppy wet, it's going to air dry in a two minutes. So then do you have to reapply it another time? Because ultimately you'd have to reapply it five times to get that 10 minute contact time and because it air dries. So I think that the guidance from CDC is to the shortest dwell times possible on a label so that it matches closer to what is really going on in the cleaning and disinfection world. And that is that we're spraying and wiping or we're using a bucket and a cloth and a microfiber and we're doing that and it dries in two minutes. And then they, what I don't like is these disinfectant wipes that no one prescribes how, how much a square inches a for each one of those wipes, uh, will it point. disinfect? Now, point, yeah. And that table in front of you, you may need to have three wipes, but people will use one wipe for the whole table, and all they're doing is spreading it around, and there are problems with the disinfectants. But I don't know if I answered your question, but I think that they're going for the shorter contact times just because it will closer match. So if the regulators come along and they say, well, it says here on the label, three minutes, and I watched it. And it dried in a minute and a half. They're wanting you to re-wet it so it matches the three-minute contact sure. time. When So if we get shorter contact times, I recommend anything less than two minutes, three minutes on the outside, less than three minutes, and hopefully closer to two or one minute contact time. So, so do you think that's an issue, especially in your hospitals, where, like Jack said, people want to see... 30 seconds, a minute, whatever they want to see, especially I think with young buyers coming into the world and coming to those purchasing rules. I do you think that's just a marketing ploy like Jack was saying? And then my other question there would be, yeah, the customer, your patient, your staff, whatever, you know, they like to see that 30 seconds, two minutes, whatever it may be. But who, who actually does that matter to? Is that a state thing? Is it state officials? Especially in that, talk talk to that too, if you don't mind. One of the sad facts, Connor, is that the Joint Commission, Jack, you mentioned earlier, is the third party regulator of hospitals. And they've got their own criteria, but they do not have a cleaning standard in the Joint Commission standards. It falls under infection prevention. And so they're looking for a sanitary, no visible dust, and no visible poop on walls or whatever it is. But so they're going for visuals and then they'll look at your infection rates and the standard, or you guys just trip my triggers. But anyway, Jack, (laughs) I think that the regulators, if the joint commission comes in, they could have a secret shopper sitting over in the corner. They're watching people come in and go out of the room and whether they're washing their hands and what have you. And then they watch the housekeeper come in and start wiping things down. And the state surveyor, the regulator will say, what's the contact on your contact time? And they may not even know what contact means, yep. but they're looking at that. And then they'll go and look at the label and say, it says on here, five minutes. And it didn't stay wet for five minutes. I think that gold standard is going to be for for disinfectants going to be shorter contact times better more organisms and like i said that new and emerging pathogens list that epa has come up with and so as you go out the chemical disinfectants salespeople they don't even know what contact time <laughs> means they know what's on the label it's educating people that if it's applied to a pre-cleaned surface in 30 seconds is all that you need but basically don't spray it on and wipe it off if you use a bucket and a cloth and then it should just air dry if that takes two minutes then i don't care what disinfectant because if you pre-clean the surface then there's no soil to really inhibit the active ingredients in that disinfectant so Disinfectants, Jack, you ask a disinfectant and that's a six log reduction. So if you start off with a million, 
If you're happy with 99.9%, then you still leave about 10,000 on the surface. Out of a million, you'll have 10,000 if you only have 99.9% as a sanitizer. But those 10,000 that are left, one bacterium by itself will divide sexually it divides and within eight hours it's up over ten thousand yeah. one survivor one survivor so, of the ten thousand yeah yeah so if you got ten thousand of them then within probably four hours it's as if you never cleaned or never disinfected the room because they, the survivors have replicated and we can get into can disinfectants become resistant to bacteria because that's a phenomenon that you may have heard of a possibility. But some of these legacy disinfectants like phenolics have been around for 120 years, disinfecting surfaces. Quats are later. Bleach has been around for a long time. But what we know is that these legacy disinfectants, one of the things that the EPA's inspector general back in in 2005, ask EPA to recertify these disinfectants. Some of them have been out for 20 years, and they were certified, registered at a level that the new disinfectants, Daryl's disinfectant made in his bathtub, are held to a higher standard than what they were held to 30 years ago when they registered them. And so they won them all on a level playing field. And when they started their reinspection program, out of the first uh, hundred or so that they tested, some of these had been for a long time and not to the newer standards, out of 175, I'm failed. Wow, that's mm -hmm. crazy. And uh, so that's when the, I think that's when the money people kept in and said, we got to stop this. Pro I don't know if, but the Clorox bleach had to remove their tuberculocidal claim because the EPA actually went out into the field. And so it's not in a sterile lab somewhere that these things get tested. Why don't we test them in the, in reality? Yeah. And with soil load and with contact times. And what they found out is that their, their bleach, bleach was, was a tuberculocidal. OSHA's bloodborne pathogen requires a one to 10 bleach solution or tuberculocidal. And so they made them remove tuberculocidal from their label. And so they had to, it was about six months before they, they retested and they got, they had to change their formula. But in the meantime, they didn't let the distributors know that, that it had failed. And so we were buying bleach at the time and whenever I found out that they had to remove their tuberculocidal claim from it, I stopped using it, but until it could be recertified. But we, we have a problem with, with the disinfectants. And when people challenge me on this 30 seconds or just let it air dry, I said, those tests are in a sterile lab. There's no physical removal going on with that. Come out in the field and test those six log reduction disinfectants. I bet they won't reach more than a one or two log, which a one log is a sanitizer. We play games with these, these terms about log reduction and that a disinfectant is a six log reduction. That's a 99.99999 percent reduction and but it's not reality it's not the real world answer this question for me this is again we're wrapping up close to an hour here and again i think the one takeaway from this is what i thought i knew and probably connor's thinking the same thing is there's just so much to know within this space and guys like you we need more of you out there in the world quite honestly because i think everyone thank you I think everyone talks the talk, but I think they regurgitate what they've heard pieces here and there. And most of the regurgitation is from sales reps who really don't, to your point earlier, don't know what they're talking about. Want to sell something. I remember the first, I remember one of the sales reps I had once I worked with and we were in a hospital and he was basically the sales rep I was with. I was supporting him, but he, the IP professional was asking, does it kill this? Yes. Before they finish the question, yes. He did. I go, how did you know all this? He goes, I just, he goes, I just say yes to everything. And they never question me because they never read the label to your point, Daryl. But 
I thought that's uh, the typical sales rep. And again, we've got to get out of that. But let me ask you, this is always what's baffled me. And this is something, I, again, I would urge everyone to reach out to Daryl if you want to have more insight. I think he is a wealth of knowledge. But the thing that I always gone back and forth, this is kind of like the old Ford Chevy Dodge debate, but mopping versus disinfecting floors. The other yeah. one. You go into a certain setting, okay, maybe it's an office tower, maybe it's a hospital, maybe it's a school, maybe it's a daycare. But the reality is when you disinfect that surface, as soon as someone walks on that floor, it's mm -hmm. no longer truly disinfecting. And we've all, I, me being a cheesy sales guy, I, you've heard of <laughs> sticky floors and what causes sticky floors is probably the yeah. quad buildup. That's a good sales guy is going to say, hey, that's the uh, that's the disinfecting, grabbing hold of the, the germ from the feet and holding it, <laughs> holding it to Sucking the floor. Sucking the right? dirt off the bottom of your shoes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good sales rep would say that. <laughs> but what is your position on this? If you were a contract cleaner or you're a cleaning professional out there and you get these bed specs to say, I want you to disinfect the floor every single day, two times a day, three times a day, one time a day, whatever it may be. What is your position on disinfecting floors? I think it's a waste of money. I'm an advocate and CDC and that 2008 cleaning and disinfection guidelines said that clean floors are as important as disinfected floors because of the problem, as you said, that it doesn't stay disinfected very long. And so just the presence of people in that room, if it's, I don't care if it's a patient in a bed, humans shed, I think it's something like a million skin cells an hour, something, well, phenomenal. <laughs> And with those skin cells comes the resoiling of that floor is the largest horizontal surface in that room. And gravity works to where everything falls to the floor. So I think that unless it's cleaning up a blood spill or someone threw up or whatever, that I'm not an advocate for using disinfectants on floors because of, first of all, when you can a general purpose cleaner, they'll do a good job and it's two cents a gallon in use dilution and disinfectants are 35 cents a gallon or a dollar a gallon, then save your money and put it somewhere else. But I believe that we should be cleaning floors. And as I said earlier, with the soil goes the bad guys. And I say, how can we clean with dirty, dirty water, dirty equipment? I flew into the airport here in St. Louis a couple of years ago, and it was like 10 o'clock at night. Of course, everyone rushes off the plane, heads to the bathroom. I get to the bathroom, and here's a guy in there mopping the floors, and his mop water was as black as tar. And I took a picture of that, and I say, how can you clean dirty water? How can you clean with dirty tools? And uh, so I'm an advocate for for doing a better job of cleaning and I believe that will go a long way towards public health preservation and Florence Nightingale proved it back in the 1700s that if we do a better job of cleaning in the Crimean War more people were dying of infections from battlefield wounds than were dying of the battlefield wounds themselves and she came along and decided to shovel out the outhouse and lives started being saved right away. And so it's a, it's brain science or rocket science. We do a better job cleaning than the public is going to be the recipients of that. And we won't know how many lives we saved. Absolutely. Last question for you. And this is one, again, cleaning has been on the, yeah, we had a former boss of mine. He said cleaning's on the leading edge of low technology, but Looking fast forward five years, 10 years, maybe even sooner than that, but what do you see on the horizon as it pertains to disinfecting? What things are piquing your interest saying, hey, that's a novel idea. If they can make this thing happen, I'm going to be a proponent of it. What do you see out there? Jack, you brought up floors, and I believe there's a probiotic floor cleaner. And the idea of probiotic is that they are, they're non-infective, non-pathogenic bacteria, and they're by the trillions. And so when you mop a floor, you know, say you clean the floor and then you mop it with probiotics, if you could visualize this, you know, that table in front of you, you put probiotics on the third closest to me, 
within three days, they will have moved to spread all the way to the other end of the table. And what they do is eat up all the food. Think about mm. bacteria mm. needing food. And they make it a hostile environment for the pathogenic organisms. Yep. So when you, it's like the hunger games for bacteria. And the healthy bacteria are multiplying so fast that they eat up all the food and bad guys starve. And so they're using this in, in, I think that the real application is to put it on floors. We talked about floors and how quickly they resoil. I've seen pictures where they use this like in a food production plant and the men's bathroom is upstairs. They put it on the floor of the food production area, but not up the stairs and up into the men's re- restroom. Then a week, the stairs had cleaned themselves just on the shoes, the footwear of these guys mm-hmm. walking with this probiotic upstairs. So I think that probiotics are something that, you know, when you think about probiotics for your stomach, it is putting healthy bacteria into your stomach to overcome some of the bad guys. And so I think probiotics has to be really seriously looked at. And there, I just put a post on LinkedIn last week, I believe, but it's a, this known scientific research over in Germany that has looked at probiotics and they have certified that probiotics are the future and that hospitals that, and they did this over a four year time span with, I don't know how many hospitals, 20, something like that. And they actually reduced the rate of hospital acquired infections from four and a half percent down to about 2%. Interesting. Mm. And so it's creating this hostile environment for bacteria to, uh, to replicate in. That's good insight. I need to do some little further research on that. That's the first time I've heard of bacteria producing or is enzyme producing bacteria in bathroom settings it's for urinal? not the same as enzymes because yeah. these are living organisms. These are actually living. To enzymes yeah. gobbling them up like the Pac-Man. Yep. I did. But anyway, these are living bacteria that, that just make a hostile environment for the bad guys. You're going to definitely pique some interest out of uh, yeah. Hunger Games. Of- Hunger Games. <laughs> Daryl, we've gone on about an hour and we'd like to keep this an hour. I think there's, I think there's literally, I want to have you back at some point and maybe we'll dial in on specific topics, but I think yeah. the knowledge that you bring to this industry, thank you first and foremost, and think it's something that those out there that are entering the business, I would definitely say reach out to Daryl because he is a wealth of information. He is an expert in the field. Even those who have been in the business, the spray and wipe type of people who are out there still, I think you've got something you can teach and Daryl, what is the, again, the best way to reach you? Your own LinkedIn. So Daryl Hicks, I think you've got J. J. Daryl Hicks, right? Is the Yes. And I'll put that in the show notes. But your email address again, Daryl? Daryl, D-A-R-E-L, at D-A-R-E-L-H-I-C-A-S dot com. Awesome. Again, we appreciate it. Any final thoughts before we wrap up here? Anything you want to say to wrap it up? Now, I think we should save it for next time, but I'd really like to get into the problem that biofilm is creating in our world and we can get into it then. But I could spend some time telling you we're with this spray and wipe that we're in, we're not affecting the biofilm and it's going to be a real problem in the world. Because it shields, hides the bad guys, and as soon as the threat is over, they resurface without anyone even touching them. The surface returns to its pre, pre-cleaning, disinfecting state within hours. And so it's a real problem, and I don't think anyone's talking about it, but biofilm removal has got to be part of our educating people from the top all the way down to the frontline workers. Let's make that a, a topic definitely for sure. I'll use your spray and pray because I think that's a, a clever tap. <laughs> you can use my R-O-L. Yeah, trademark. Oh, yes, I love that. Now. If you have a... Uh, Share the profit. What are you bringing, that's Connor? Whole, yeah. <laughs> that's the whole thing here. I think we're connecting dots in the industry. And I, you know, people who take time to listen to this, I think they'll gather something from it. But Daryl, again, appreciate the time. Appreciate the uh, the ability to sit here and chat with you for your hour. You've been generous with your time and I uh, appreciate everything you're doing out there in the industry. Okay, guys, look forward to the next time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 